Good morning, everyone, again. Thank you, Ato uh, Hermes, for the wonderful presentation. It perfectly fits into what we are going to discuss this morning, the ecosystem. So he was repeatedly saying, we are here to enable, facilitate, and support the ecosystem around that, which perfectly aligns uh, with what we are going to discuss today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back again to this second day session. Uh, I think yesterday we had a wonderful and exciting day. We have touched a number of topics, exciting and uh, great lineup of um, you know, speakers, presenters, panelists. In the afternoon particularly, we had two sessions, the insurance session, the other side, and the banking discussion was going on here. And in some cases, particularly in the insurance, they were not, they, were, they, they even said, we don't have to go for coffee or anything like that until we finish what we started. And it was exciting. Please give um, applause for yourself and for coming back again. And uh, I think um, as far as the organization of this uh, summit is concerned, it's growing, uh, as you can imagine, from time to time. So this is, there is nothing that excites us than seeing this maturing and seeing attracting many people and also raising many important topics that we need to discuss. And we are in the knowledge uh, era, as you all know it. We cannot do anything. Uh, without knowledge. And that happens uh, in addition to other mechanisms, having the conversation, learning from each other, sharing perspectives, challenging each other, and bringing very fundamental and critical topics to the front. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And I believe we are uh, moving for, uh, forward towards the right direction. So today also, in addition to yesterday, as you can see, I'm not sure how many of you have downloaded because every time you remember last year it was a, a printed version and now we're trying to be green from time to time and environmentally friendly that we didn't want to print the book of abstract if you come if you see here two uh, you see two QR, QR codes and the first one is the book of abstract. You see everything that is happening. Who is speaking? What is the topic? How many sessions we have? Who moderates? Who presents is here. And please, I invite you to download from here and see everything. And, as you, and, and also, interestingly, there are pictures of moments captured. So you can download as many pictures as, as you need. You don't need to send emails and ask for pictures. Now you can, you can find it here um, any time of the day. And um, so my role today is, is uh, moderating this session in the morning. And just to give you an idea of what we're about to talk, is like I tried to briefly mention, we're going to talk about ecosystem. So now, from time to time, the importance of ecosystem perspective has grown. And it's become very critical to see not piece by piece, but things, uh, sectors, and, and, and a lot of things from ecosystem perspective. And when we have that view, and we realize that there are many players, and there are many issues that we need to take account into account. So it wouldn't be fair uh, if we uh, do not, if, you, if we forget to talk about the ecosystem enablers, the drivers of finance sector ecosystem, which of course we cannot address everything in this two-day session or in one particular session, but we will focus on what we think are important. So this morning, we have, like I said, in exciting sessions, interesting sessions, and now, right now, uh, session four is on drivers of finance sector ecosystem from a perspective of leadership, particularly, and then we see it from uh, infrastructure perspective and, and uh, technology as much as possible. So under this, we are going to uh, uh, have two presentations, I mean three presentations, and then panel discussion. I'll give you, as we uh, continue to that, I'll give you the idea of who is going to talk, what topic, and then who are going to be the panel um, group of members. And then session five, the most interesting session uh, would happen after the coffee break. And we call it like, it's a heartbeat of the global dynamism. That's what I say. Because 
things are happening in the global world, in the global village, okay? Now, there are shifts and there are talks, there are discussions about the new world order. Now, are we sitting aside and, and watching while things are happening, or we become a part of the game and have our own perspectives into that? And that discussion will happen, uh, it is, um, on global dynamism and the emerging world order, what are the challenges, what are the implications, and alternatives for the East African Finance Summit is going to be discussed in detail, and you, will, you, you don't want to miss uh, this session. In the afternoon, uh, another interesting dedicated to capital market development. How do we take, so, so many things have happened, as already discussed by Ato Hermias, and yesterday raised, but the key question is, Dr. Brook also highlighted in the morning, but the key question is that, are we ready to tap into the opportunities that are coming in this capital market domain? And what is happening? What is the status? And as well as we will see from um, a few presentations, from experience from the region, uh, we will have people talking from, I mean, having, um, uh, sharing their experiences, how banks and insurances participated in other countries and how they took advantage of that. These are the discussions we are addressing today and I believe these are th today is the most important part of this um, summit um, in addition to what we talked yesterday. So let me, without further ado, let me take you to what we're um, doing this morning and I will invite, um, I will invite our, yeah, okay. Sorry, thank you. So uh, there's going to be a presentation uh, and I will introduce our first presenter uh, who is James uh, Baya Harunya. Am I right? Uh, forgive me, no? Okay, don't penalize me, <laughs> please. A general manager Ragzio, uh, of Ragzio Data Center, Uganda, who is going to uh, share with us uh, the role of secure data centers for finance sector ecosystem enablers, uh, experience from the region, that's what we're going to see, uh, talk about. And uh, just to give you a brief profile of uh, Mr. James, he's the general manager right now for uh, Raxio. And um, he has been at the front, at the forefront of designing, building, operating, and maintaining Uganda's first Tier 3 Carrier Neutral Data Center or with over 30, 20 years of experience in ISP, data center, and uh, telco in network administration, service and infrastructure uh, support, and executive management. James has a comprehensive and in-depth knowledge of wireless, VSAT, and cable networks, project management of uh, cross-functional projects in ISP and telco related fields as well as a strategy and planning uh, expertise on uh, voice, video and data products. Um, in addition, James is also certified data center management professional, so we are listening to from the right person about it, and a Juniper Network Certificate Internet Specialist, Cisco Certified Internet Professional, ITIL Professional, and um, Extreme Network Specialist. Uh, in addition to that, preceding to his role, uh, which he is holding, current, holding currently at Raxio Data Center, Mr. James served as a founding director and chief technical officer at Rock Telecom. Um, he also sits on several boards, including the board of uh, Fonts Foundation Uganda. Uh, in addition, he is also sitting as a board of ICT Association of Uganda. Please join me in welcoming our first um, presenter for this particular session to the stage. Please. Hi. Thanks, Gamesh. Um, all right, uh, first of all, good morning everyone, I'm so excited to be here. My first job today is to teach you some Ugandan names. 
since clearly it's not very easy to pronounce. But don't feel bad because we have the same problem. We, can, we struggle with different names from different cultures. So at least if you learn something today, it will be how to pronounce my name. Uh, my name is James Biaruhanga. Um, it actually translates to for God. So you're in presence of a very great person right now. Um, yeah, as they say, I'm from Uganda. I'm currently the general manager for Raxio Data Center. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, Raxio because it kind of gives perspective on, um, on who we are and what we do. And then I'll share my insights around you know, the financial sector and data centers and how the two play together. So, Gimechi has already said all these things, uh, but I'll just summarize them. I've got over 20 years of experience um, in telecom space. Currently, I'm with Raxio Data Center. Um, previously, I was with Rock Telecom, uh, where I'm one of the founding partners, so I'm still involved as a director. Um, before that, I was with MTN Uganda and MTN Group in South Africa. And prior to that, I was with Africa Online, Africa Online Uganda and Ghana, um, working mostly in networks. Uh, my career has spanned from the network side um, to the management side, uh, more recently to, co to the commercial and thought leadership side. Um, so I'm excited to be here because also my career has allowed me to travel and meet great people like you. Um, just a little bit about Raxio and probably we can talk more for anyone who's interested. We have a booth um, in the exhibition area. We are a Pan-African player. We are specifically focusing on carrier neutral data centers. Um, <coughs> we're building tier three certified data centers. We started in 2018. Uh, Uganda was the first operation um, that we launched, and I, I was in the forefront of running this. And now um, we're basically ro rolling out the rest of Africa. As I mentioned, we're Pan-African. Um, you can see Uganda is live. Our second site is incidentally in Ethiopia. Um, we shall be going live before the end of the year uh, with the Raxio Data Center in Ethiopia. It's situated in the ICT park. Uh, and the gentleman Bucket that I'm sitting with um, is the general manager for Ethiopia. And like I said, we have a booth. So excited to talk to all of you guys about what we're looking at doing and um, how we think we can change your lives as well as, of course, you change our lives. But we also have other countries that are currently in development. We've got Cote d'Ivoire, Maputo, Mozambique is also under development, um, Angola, Luanda, uh, Tanzania, and then Kishasa DRC. And this is the first seven countries of at least 10 countries that we want to roll out in the next three years. Um, so far, we've done a fundraising of about 200 million and above. And basically, we are going on hard to see how much we can really influence the ecosystem. And uh, if I'm to talk a little bit about Uganda so you get the context when I explain the experiences that we've had, um, right now we've got a 1.5 megawatt facility built in Uganda. Um, it supports up to about 400 racks. Um, we have a plan to build a second site to support it, um, which will be twice the capacity in terms of power and racks. Um, we've been running for two years. We opened on May 25th, 2021. Um, so now we've got a fair amount of experience, and that's what I'm here to share with you guys. So um, allow me to also look at my slides as I speak with you. Um, I want to just start by talking about the trends in the financial sector. And these are the trends that we are seeing in Africa, the trends that we are seeing in Uganda. And obviously, these are the trends that you most likely are seeing in Ethiopia or you will see soon anyway. Um, cloud and data virtualization um, has become a very central topic. We've moved away from the era where everyone was hard-coded into wanting to have their own infrastructure, but rather starting to think about adoption of cloud as a way to store data. Yeah, so we're seeing cloud computing becoming very central, and especially edge computing. Um, so many people are looking at shared infrastructure as a way to scale, to grow, and also to be able to have time to market. Um, IoT, which is the Internet of Things. IoT is clearly now the main thing. Everyone is running a connected life at the moment. Your phones, your watches, your cars, your, your devices at home. Same way it's moving into the financial services sector. 
um, you realize that every single thing that's running banking at the moment, that's running fintechs at the moment, is connected to the internet in some way. And as a result of that, we've got adoption of artificial intelligence. The biggest topic this year is chat GPT. Um, how everyone is looking at using AI as a way to simplify customer service, customer engagement, sales cycles. Um, this has become very central. Um, we're starting to see, unfortunately, a few cases of layoffs in some of the areas that can be replaced with AI because efficiency is very important. But that layoff does not necessarily mean that we're being replaced, but rather repositioned into other places. Um, machine learning. Uh, I was in another conference two days ago uh, at the Sheraton here, and um, machine learning was highlighted as one of the things that has made an efficiency for a bank in Ethiopia. Um, so clearly, it's one of the trends that we're starting to see. Um, ATMs becoming the queue lines instead of, you know, front of the counter. Banking, uh, whether it's deposit or withdrawals, running everything from the ATM, bank statements coming out of there. You remember how long we used to take to just sit down and receive a bank statement, uh, not a few years back. Of course, with all this IT that's happening, cybersecurity is becoming such a central issue and it's becoming the weakest link. So we are starting to see a huge trend in cybersecurity, whether it's through shared infrastructure by you know, financial services institutes together or whether it is becoming um, a private sector deliverable to support the financial services sector. What I find most exciting, internet exchange point peerings between financial services providers, internet service providers, public sector, and international um, content providers. This is a new trend, and it's an exciting trend, because suddenly you can exchange every single thing across an internet exchange point, keeping local content local, and at the same time being able to actually uh, be more efficient and faster, and more secure. The big topic in the last three years, big data analytics, using big data information gathered from all this cloud computing, gathered from the age to make important business decisions through analysis. And of course, decentralizing your computing capacity through blockchain. All these are different topics that are becoming very, very critical. Um, in, the, in the financial sector and computing space, however, there's just one thing that all of these fall under. It's the fourth industrial revolution. Um, from when we were in school, we started all the different stages of re revolutions um, until we didn't realize that we we're actually living in the middle of a revolution. And now it's real. Um, the whole world is kind of at the same stage. And the young continents like Africa are going to be forced to take the, you know, the mantle and drive this thing forward. So what we're seeing in terms of the different trends in the financial sector and the computing sector, they are all really part of the same fourth industrial revolution. And we have to figure out how do we adopt into this and be able to use it um, to keep us at the same wavelength as the rest of the global markets. So my conversation is supposed to be about the role that you know, data centers play for the financial services industry. Everyone who's running a financial services company realizes that you need a strategic disaster recovery location. Gone are the days when you could operate in a way that you can give your customer an excuse when you have downtime, or give a regulator an excuse when you have downtime. That's not the case anymore. Now you must have a strategic location for disaster recovery because your service must be up 100% of the time. Data centers give you a chance to be able to have maybe a primary and a disaster recovery location, or two primary locations, up to you. Um, security. Uh, we know that data is the cliche that we use is the new gold, um, but it's also true. So security, whether it's physical or cyber, is very critical. So data centers provide you an opportunity to have a very high secure environment because most of them are usually designed with security inbuilt. Choosing a disaster recovery location or a primary location or any other place to put your data without connectivity in the fourth industrial revolution is just useless. So you need locations where you have significant amount of connectivity and, importantly, the right to choose who you want to use as your connectivity partner. So data centers also give you a chance to have several connectivity options. 
We call ourselves carrier neutral because we are open to everyone delivering their own connectivity options because then the customer can pick and choose who they want to work with. Um, there is a new era of colocation. Uh, a lot of times before you would, you would not be as flexible uh, with different data centers, but now you can choose whether you want to go the cloud direction or the collocation direction. Collocation simply means you can bring your own equipment, put it in a carrier neutral data center, connect to any of the carriers of your choice, or even integrate with cloud providers of your choice, but without limitations and be able to utilize that as your location. You manage your equipment in a location that is actually owned by a third party infrastructure provider. Of course, the biggest problem for most of the IT people is the pain of carrying equipment from one location to another. So you find that most of these data centers lately um, will provide you a lift and shift service. So they will come, carry your equipment for you, shift it to the new location, stack it up, and basically bring it to life. To make life easy for the IT uh, administrators or even the management teams um, to make a decision to move from one location to another. Sometimes you find that one of your worries is that if let's say I have a, a riot in my primary site and I have to take my team to the remote location, how am I going to be able to operate? Do I need some hot desks for some time because I'm looking at a business continuity plan? Can I have meetings there? Can I access, for example, a large boardroom and be able to have meetings? Data centers these days provide you shared working environments to be able to actually work from the remote location for the times that you want to work. And then, um, as I mentioned, the presence of internet exchange points um, or network access points in data centers allow the private sector or the financial services sector to be able to integrate into the rest of the ecosystem. We call this cross-connect. And cross-connect, we find, is really being able to take advantage of the ecosystem that sits within data centers to connect between you know, different industries. But why do FSIs really choose colocation as a, as a solution? There are three main areas that we find are of high value. The first one is the intention to reduce the total cost of ownership. Total cost of ownership basically means if I'm in a position where I don't have a data center, what's my capex comparison between having it in-house versus having it out of house? If I already have a data center running or a small server room in-house, what's the comparison between the OPEX that takes to run it versus from a shared environment? Maybe we'll talk a little bit about more uh, shortly. The second thing is changing of models from CAPEX to OPEX. No one these days wants to utilize their capital for something that's not your core business. We want to allow you to focus on your core business because that's why you set up your business. Everything that is ancillary to that should ideally be handled by people whose core business is that. Because that way it allows you to focus on your core business, use your money for the right reasons, and then be able to use an OPEX model to completely go forward. And ultimately, what are you trying to do? You're trying to improve your service delivery to, to customers so that you're able to actually be known for what you actually set up for. Until maybe of, uh, a later time when you decide to... Um, the word COVID brought in was pivot into different areas, yeah? Um, what we've seen as the profile of customers in data centers, the financial services industry is still the biggest profile of customers that we see in data centers in Africa at the moment because they understand and they appreciate the need for the different things I've mentioned. We're seeing, we're seeing a trend where the cloud providers are starting to grow because they meet the fintech space, the microfinance space, um, the SME space. The MNOs or the mobile network operators are also big players uh, within the data center space, but mostly they usually have their own in-house switch centers that they provide solutions for. And then we have other small sectors, insurance, research and education network, and different other players who are actually investing in this. Now, the one thing that you have to also keep in mind is that the bigger cloud players are starting to see the interest in Africa. Uh, the big Silicon Valley giants, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Meta, 
they're starting to make their moves into Africa because they are providing a lot of cloud computing, um, storage, of course, supporting also the social media platforms and starting to play a very active role. And we should be starting to see the hyperscalers coming into the market. The Eastern giants, people like Tencent, ByteDance, or also known as TikTok, are also starting to make a move. And we're seeing Africa as the confluence position for hyperscalers. So we should see a different size of slice very soon where the uh, OTT players become the main players in the data center space. But at the moment, the enterprise markets are driven heavily by the financial services industry um, and closely followed by the telco industry. But you know that everyone works together because it's an ecosystem. Financial services, telco, ISP, insurance, everyone is doing something with the other. Um, but if we were to go straight into the financial services industry, the biggest are commercial banks. Um, they still drive the sector and also they heavily drive the adoption. The second large slice we see is the government banks, um, including central banks. Uh, we're seeing a trend where these players are now starting to actually look at collocation as a way to go forward because even governments have started realizing that there's no point in using budgeted money um, from a CAPEX perspective rather than OPEX. You'd rather use the money to build infrastructure, for example, roads that people actually need or health centers, and then use an OPEX model for things like IT services. And besides, public sector without private sector is really not going to work. But what have we learned in the last two years in the industry? Our budget cycles are a problem for everyone. Decision making takes board approvals, senior management approvals, and it takes quite a bit of time uh, before you actually have you know, decisions being made uh, by, the, by, the, by the market. So you find data center providers are constantly in that cycle of you know, when is the budget going to be approved? We're doing a hardware refresh before we can actually collocate. We don't want to collocate our old equipment and stuff like that. We've also realized that migration to the data center is a big challenge because some of the providers, or oh sorry, or the customers, e.g. yourselves, find that you already have sunk some money in in-house solutions. So you're trying to do the math of why should I move if I already have a small facility in here? And taking time to understand the value proposition of the ecosystem. So that also is an area where we have to spend so much time making sure that you know, people understand that this is way beyond um, just the CAPEX conversation. As I mentioned, there's management approvals, which also you know, bring some delays. But we're starting to see a huge change in that in the last two years in Uganda that we've been operating. Um, and the energy issue, which is basically power consumed uh, by IT infrastructure. Many of us in this room don't realize how much power is consumed by IT in our offices because the bill is part of the general bill. You receive the, 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 the power bill for the entire office and you, you, you see, I don't think it's one of the things you can challenge um, because you must keep running. But the component of IT that's, that's taking part of the power bill, how big is it and how much, how efficient is the equipment that you're running in terms of power vis-a-vis um, -vis the rest of the bill. So the power use effectiveness that you're running um, is, a, is a big difference. So we're starting to see an issue where um, the power conversation in-house versus power out of house and how it plays out. Sometimes there's a need for remote desks, as I mentioned, because disaster recovery is just one element of business continuity and financial services sectors generally need that. So the need for remote desks is always such a critical one because you don't always know how many you're going to need because you don't know how many customers are going to need them. There's also a stigma or a fear by IT officials um, to put things in out of house. Um, I am a former network administrator and I know how much I was scared to see my equipment being taken somewhere else. Who's there? What's going to happen? Is it safe? Um, understanding the new way of doing things is it's always a bit of a challenge for IT guys. Um, then of course, traditionally we have very slow procurement processes and bureaucracy in a lot of the African enterprises and we find that that's something that slows down adoption. And then finally, um, the perception that 
in-house security is higher than out of house. Um, and that's some of the stuff that we've seen. But when you look at the actual comparison between the two of them is you find that the co-location space, a lot of the costs have already been you know, absorbed by the data center providers. So you're actually saving money because you don't have to actually invest in anything. Um, it's fully redundant. And all the operational costs have already been assumed as well. So you don't actually have to also spend that kind of money. So the overall total, of, total cost of ownership becomes a whole lot lower, as I mentioned before, because of that. Um, and maybe finally, when you think about the financial services sector and the integration with the public sector, to really see what is the catalyst for this, you have to think about regulatory compliance. Every one of us in this room is, is in some way under a compliance um, body, sometimes central banks, sometimes you know, even smaller bodies. So you need disaster recovery. You need to adhere to you know, data residency in terms of data protection and privacy. There's a need to integrate with other sectors, um, especially like revenue authority, because of a lot of the online and digital platforms that we're using, credit, credit reference bureaus, national IDs, um, I saw here the private sector, for example, like Ethiolis. So the need for that integration is critical. Uh, we need an, a very good location that is going to influence local peerings between private sector and public sector. So you find that data centers are catalyst for that. And finally, we need a home for the edge computing because the future uh, of the fourth industrial revolution is driven by edge computing. So I thank you. This is brief. Um, if you want to chat a little bit more, um, we're around. Thank you.